I want to give you all a warm welcome to the very first lecture of Term 1 of Red Bull Music Academy 2018. Um, it's the 20th anniversary of RBMA and we're back in Berlin where it all started and we're here at the Funkhaus, a really incredible and inspirational space. Speaking of incredible and inspirational, um, <laughs> um, our very first guest is someone to whom the word genius is often applied. Um, I don't... Uh, really? Yeah, truly. That scares me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can talk about the genius concept later. Okay, we'll, we'll put a pin in that. Um, I'm really, really happy to welcome Robert Henker to the... Hello. To the panel. Um, so while I was um, preparing for this talk, um, there's a lot of ground to cover in terms of the length and breadth of your career and your art and your innovation. So I'm hoping that we can scratch the surface of this by asking a lot of why questions as opposed to a lot of how questions. Um, but I wanted to start with a piece of music which is not made by you. Um, and I believe that you were seven or eight when it first came out. And I believe it had a particular impact on you um, and it's going to be one of the tracks from Jean-Michel Jarre's Oxygen album. Um, so let's have a listen, and then we can talk about this album and its impact on you. Do we need to listen to all of that? Not all of it. Not all of it. We're just going to listen to a little excerpt. Okay. That's... <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, Oxygen Part 2 by Jean-Michel Jarre. I could feel you squirming <laughs> as that was being played. Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be more painful when we start listening to my own stuff. Um, <laughs> but as an interesting uh, historical side note, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, as far as I know, uh, played all of this by hand. He doesn't like sequences, so he has a drum computer and all these, these repetitive sequences is really him doing this by hand intentionally because he likes the groove of it. And this was recorded without any computer help on a multi-track recorder. So besides the cheesiness that is very obvious and becomes more obvious the more you listen to the whole album, um, the achievement technically is quite impressive. So um, as far as the sound design is concerned, this keeps up well. As far as the composition is concerned, um, it, it, there's a lot of 80s stuff which sounds amazing uh, before it becomes the main part and afterwards. <laughs> so it's all intros and outros. <laughs> yeah, you can probably create amazing mix CDs with just intros and outros of all these pieces. Um, but I'd love to know what was it that was that kind of gripped you when you were um, listening to this for the first time as a youngster? Uh, well, the to to get an idea of the impact this had was we talk about someone who grew up in a family of engineers with no artistic interest whatsoever and also no musical interest whatsoever. So there was no culture of listening uh, to music uh, in my uh, upbringing and electronic music was non-existing. So the only music I had access to was pretty much the, the rock music my parents did listen to on the radio and a bit of stuff that I did listen on the radio, which was uh, pretty similar to, well, normal mainstream rock pop of this time. And I listened to this album at a friend's place of my parents who had a fantastic stereo system. And whilst my parents were there, this album was basically playing there from vinyl. And I, I still remember the loudspeakers because I was literally standing in front of loudspeakers and was stunned because there was no vocals, there was no, there was just this endless development, endless development of sound going on. And um, the the friend of my parents noticed that this did something to me, and he promised to record a tape, and that's what he did. So I had this tape with uh, two albums from Jean-Michel Jarre uh, at home, and I would assume I've been listening to this tape of several hundred or thousand times. So. Um, that had quite some impact, and afterwards I started uh, figure, trying to figure out pre-internet and at, living at the outskirts of a boring city um, how to access such kind of music and how to find more of that. And what were your first steps to 
f to get access to this music and also to try to tease apart how it was made or how it could be replicated in a sense? Well, I went to a mainstream music store and found a completely uh, confused uh, salesperson who nevertheless tried to find something for me. And at some point he pointed me to Tangerine Dream, which turned out to be equally important at this time to me. And um, well, the rest was simple. Uh, I understood. I read a lot, so I knew what a synthesizer was, and I knew what a drum computer was, and um, then I went to a local music store and annoyed them because I had no money, but I wanted to try everything. And when I was a bit older, I started to earn my money by um, carrying out newspapers and stuff like this, and bought my first synthesizer, and from there was no turning back, and I played in a band. Um, kind of electronic rock, really horrible, and I'm incredibly thankful for the fact that it was pre-internet. Um, years ago, I found a tape recording we made, and um, I'm really, really happy that this is the only recording. <laughs> um, I believe that first synthesizer of yours was a um, Juno 6. What world did that open up for you? Like, where did it take you musically? Well, so I had a synthesizer and I had a Walkman and I had a tape deck which could record and I built myself a cheap mixing console, console is a nice word, um, a, a, a bunch of wires and transistors um, and so I was recording on my tape deck and then I was taking the tape out of the tape deck, put it in my Walkman, played it back. It was slightly out of tune because the, the speed was different. Then I played on top of it, and then I did this again and again. After four generations, it was just noise with some music in the background. Um, but these were my first experiments into doing something by myself. And um, yeah, and then playing in the band. And this was pretty much what I did until I uh, left school and finally were able to earn more money. So I was able to buy an Atari and uh, a reverb and started to build something like a small home studio. And then I moved to Berlin and that changed everything. Mm. Um, actually, I, I think at this point we can put up a photo. Um, I believe it's from 1993. It's photo number six. There we go. Oh. <laughs> oh. That is a young Robert Henker with a pretty sick mohawk. Um, standing on a rooftop in 1993. And I really, I was really drawn to this image on your website. It kind of reminded me of um, this ph photography anthology called Berlin Wonderland, which came out a few mm -hmm. years ago, which is, um, for anyone that's not aware, it's like a collection of black and white photos taken in and around Berlin, like in the first five years or so of the 90s. And they're all kind of almost surreal images, really desolate backgrounds, but all focused on like one kind of quirky character in the middle. Um, and I think this really fit into that aesthetic. So it'd, it'd be great to hear from you what Berlin was actually like at that time, if it was as um, wild and kind of limitless as it seems to be. Well, I mean, this could of course be the beginning of a talk for the next few months. Uh, so um, the for, for me personally, Berlin put two things together which turned out to be equally important. The one thing was that I started uh, to study computer science and uh, I was also connected to the electronic studio of the Technical University, which was a place of very academic computer music research, um, research into sound generation, uh, exposure to serious composers of uh, electronic and electroacoustic music, uh, which was again something which I had no clue about before. So I heard Xenakis, I heard Francois Bale, Parmigiani, uh, Stockhausen, all these people I had no idea about. And at the same time, Berlin to me was going to Tresor and uh, being profoundly shocked the first night because it was just so much more than I could handle. And I left after half an hour and I thought I will never come back. And guess what, the next day I was back. Um, so these two very, very different forces, the 
the refinement and the code and waiting one night to calculate five seconds of sound versus insanely loud bass drum, hi-hat snare and uh, lots of fog and strobe and half-naked people dancing. Uh, this was something which uh, basically shaped my whole experience. And the, the situation in Berlin which made all this possible was to, to condense this in a really brief uh, history. In East Germany, there was no private property, so everything was state-owned. Uh, a lot of buildings in East Berlin, including a lot of small factories and manufacturing spaces, were state-owned. So the GDR disappeared, the system vanished, and there was still no owner. And the previous owners were either um, people who had to leave Germany to, to flee from the Nazi regime, or they were killed. So um, there were basically buildings where the ownership was not clear. And that meant that it was possible for artists to more or less just go in there. Um, and the city government at some point made a very important decision to say, OK, we have the choice. Either these, peop these buildings are vandalized and empty, or these people are rent out for nothing, basically, to artists. Um, we don't know exactly what they're doing in there, but at least they keep the windows shut uh, and the heating intact. So um, it was possible to find the most amazing industrial spaces, spaces which are similar to what you have here um, on a smaller scale, but very similar in terms of interior, in terms of architecture, in terms of accessibility, um, right in the center of the city and do something. All you had to do is go to the city government and say, um, I'm an art student, I want to make an art project in there. And opening a bar meant putting a, a few um, boxes of beer, a small PA and a turntable in it, and that's it. And since electronic music culture was not established as a commercial culture, no one even thought of what's with the money they earn there. You know, no one cared. And that meant um, zero investment. And that meant it was possible to do all kinds of strange experiments. Uh, it didn't matter if two people showed up for a concert, because there were no costs involved. So you just met with your friends and you played some music, and some more friends came by, and then some more friends. And um, at some point you decided, OK, maybe we need a door, and we need to um, have a better coffee machine. Um, and next time we bring more beer. But that was it. And this. Uh, situation allowed for two things. It allowed for musical experiments and it also allowed for uh, a social experiment, like how can you interact with people, what kind of, what is a club as a social experience, uh, but also very important, a audiovisual experience and a spatial experience. If, if you come in an empty space, you have to make a decision. Where do I put my loudspeakers? Where do I put the bar? Where is the DJ or the live performer? Um, where is the audience? And this led to all these nice situations of the DJ playing right in the middle of the audience, uh, doing quadraphonic sound just to try it out, having bass bins uh, two stories be below and enjoy the fact that the bass is rumbling through the whole building before it reaches the dance floor. All kinds of crazy shit you could just do. And um, this, this vibe made it possible to uh, be very naive in a very good sense. And um, it, it didn't matter what you tried out musically as long as someone liked it. You know, you, you could try the most bizarre things. And if you listen to early techno, it's so obvious that people just threw together whatever they had in mind. Um, it was much more uh, eclectic than what came out 10 years later when everything became more formalized and there was already a, a recipe. There was no recipe at the beginning. If you, if you listen to um, early KLF or if you listen to uh, many, many other records of that time, you know, someone started with a shouting sample in a track, someone else copied it and added something else, um, including, of course, of course, horrible scenarios where um, there was this kind of commercial thing with uh, dog barking dog voices pitched up and down um, but everything was possible and i don't know where we started but that's how it was 
Do you, I'm curious, do you believe that um, now that things have changed in terms of this city, perhaps in terms of the commercialization of certain types of formerly underground types of music, do you believe it is at all possible for young people coming up now to be able to replicate those conditions somehow of being boundless and being unrestricted? Um, or do you believe that that's been lost? Well, this is a difficult question to ask someone who is approaching 50, because um, I, I feel I'm, I'm not an expert in talking about what 20-year-old people should do or uh, what they even are doing, because I know too little. But um, I believe there is, there's always a way to, to find uh, creative niches, because there always was. And there is in every society and in every culture, even in the most oppressive ones, there's always ways around the official doctrine. And um, I, I experienced two things. As, as far as the electronic dance music culture is concerned, obviously, uh, this type of music and this type of expression is still of interest to people in their early 20s. Because when I perform, I see people in this age who are interested and who are performing right after or before me. And I don't feel that I don't belong there or that there's a huge cultural or age gap, which is super nice. Um, but of course, there's also a lot of different ways to express yourself these days. So in a way, the, the internet made it possible to collaborate and exchange yourself with people all over the globe. So instead of having regional boundaries, so back in the 90s, you had regional pockets. So the, the Berlin scene and the Cologne scene and the Detroit scene. They were all centered around, okay, this is a, this regional space with all these people in here and everyone here shares the same idea. And there's another regional space somewhere else which shares a different idea which might be connected or not. And now you have this global um, onion ring scenario where <clears throat> all over the world you have people interested in the same electronic music and there are only a few people but they're connected to a few others all around the globe. So, and we're orbiting around this globe. And this, sometimes this is even uh, actually strange that you go somewhere to a completely different cultural background and you go to a party and you listen to exactly the same tracks you listen to in Berlin. Um, and sometimes I, some, I, I almost wish that I go, just making something up, I go to Namibia and experience a completely different type of electronic music um, at the places where I have access to. I, I say the last sentence because who knows, perhaps there is something going on which is just not in my onion ring and therefore um, it's happening right below or above me and I have no clue. So, uh, I, as, as far as, as I know, there is a lot of interesting things going on and um, it's probably wrong to look at exactly a specific type of electronic dance music for innovation because this if, if the music ends up in a shoe store for selling uh, expensive shoes, you know that it can't be underground anymore in the same way it was 25 years ago. But I assume there's different scenes, there's different things going on, which might just emerge right now, and which might not even be connected to purely listening to music. I'm uh, only uh, very uh, vaguely familiar with, for instance, what's going on in, in game engine development and what people do with game engines these days. Who knows what comes up with as great art forms using game engines in a few years, where people do the most amazing virtual reality experiences that, of course, include electronic music. So, who knows what's happening? I mean, you seem to be somebody who is always, um, there's always a sense of like forward momentum in what you're doing. Um, going from studying computer music, making music, using hardware instruments, creating, um, creating software to be able to revolutionise the way that you perform with those instruments and so on and so forth. I mean, is, is kind of the future of gaming and VR, I mean, is that something that you could see yourself developing an interest in in the future? Because you, you always seem to be kind of like um, a step ahead of where you are. Um. In my own personal uh, view of myself, 
I'm not a step ahead. I'm actually a very conservative person uh, in my usage of technology, for instance. And uh, so I, I need to separate a little bit what I attempt to contribute with uh, my colleagues at Ableton, where, of course, the, the question always is, how does the world musically look like in five years or ten? Because we have to find answers to that, and we're working on this, of course. And this is one part, and the other part is my artistic life. And in my artistic life, I, I reached a stage where I'd rather like to refine and explore all these loose threads that accumulated over the last 30 years of my life, rather than throwing myself into something new. So I feel that I need to spend more time in the studio working on just electronic music, because I have so many ideas that I'd like to explore that are informed by the things I'm doing currently. But for those ideas, I don't need new instruments, I don't need new software, I don't need new hardware. I just need time. And the same goes for my installation works. I'm not working with the latest technology, uh, and I never did in a way. Um, and I, I'd rather like to refine the, all these ideas which I have in my mind. So I, I don't think that necessarily if I would try to, to learn to, let's say, uh, program in Unity or what, whatever is the en vogue game engine these days, uh, would solve any artistic question. It, it would rather take all my time to learn the platform. And um, this, the same comes, is true for buying new equipment. Of course, I'm temp tempted to buy equipment because I like machines. I, I find synthesizers and reverb units and all these kind of things really sexy. There's some things that are insanely beautiful. They are engineering highlights and I love them. But uh, let's say if I buy another digital synthesizer from the early 80s, it wouldn't solve any artistic question at all. It wouldn't make my compositions just one notch better, nothing. Because I have more sounds uh, in my library than I can ever use for the next 500 years. So the last thing I should spend my time with is looking on eBay if someone sells insert great synthesizer here. Um, because it's pointless. I, I still do sometimes and afterwards I think, okay, now I spent an insane amount of money for this vintage reverb, but to be honest, this plug-in, which I recently got for free from this uh, friend of mine, is actually better. So, um, I, I, I think I should not focus on new technologies, I should focus on new ways of expressing myself within my, my framework. I think that's something we're going to come back to in a moment, but um, you mentioned Ableton, so I feel like this is probably a good time to introduce the background and your involvement in the development of Ableton Live. If we could look at photo number seven, please. Another one from the vault. Uh, oh, this is... <laughs> can you describe fine. what's happening here? Well, this is me. I can clearly see that. It looks similar. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this other guy here is Mr. Gerhard Bieles. Um, I have been telling this story for so often that I won't repeat it. I didn't like this guy at all when I met him in Munich. Um, I went to Berlin to start a new life, and guess who was in my first lecture at the uh, university? This guy. We became best friends. We started making music together, like here. And this guy, at some point, decided after finishing studying that the own software company from music software would be the thing to do. He founded Ableton, he knocked on the door and said, Robert, we need you. I joined and, well, the rest you know. So what you see here is Mr. Gerhard Billes and myself playing a very conceptual con uh, concert. Um, the synthesizer here, the Yamaha SY77, is a very complex machine which uh, you can program in such a way that if you press down a few keys, uh, there's a lot of looping envelopes going on inside that create some very complex, long, droney sounds that changes over time. And our conceptual idea was that we both start with the same sound, we press down the same keys, use matches to keep them pressed down, and then we together start editing the sound. 
everyone just in any way we wanted. So we get this different types of drony structures going on that go further and further apart or met again. And after half an hour or whenever we felt like it's enough, we um, got, go, went through all the parameters and made them the same again, so that we ended at the same sound again. So after half an hour of playing, I said, operator one, release rate 15. Gerhard, clack, 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 clack. Um, operator two, attack rate 12, and I, clack, 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 clack. So until we were back to the same sound again, and then we finished. Um, so this was called the symmetrical concert, and we played it, as I said on the website, uh, in front of audience as big as five people. And um, well, maybe this was 10 here. And yeah, so much to this poster photo. And I guess the question was more about Ableton, right? Yeah, but we can, uh, we, we can go there in stages. Um, <laughs> I'm going to bring up another photo, which is number 17, please. Ah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> you, you, you did your homework. I deep dived into your website. Um, is this so, online? Yeah, it is. It is. Oh. oh, actually, that wasn't on your website. I found it somewhere else. <laughs> um, but this is uh, the PX18 sequencer. Um, I'd love it if you could uh, explain what is happening on this screen and how you develop this together with Gerhard. Okay, so this is a Max patch, which Gerhard and me used for creating music, both on stage and in the studio. And let's walk a little bit. So. Uh, Obviously, this is here is one bar of music and velocities. And <clears throat> this looked better when it was opened in Max 4. In Max 4, this whole thing didn't look so strange. Um, this photo was taken using it, the same Max patch in a later Max version, which had a different graphics, so it's a bit fucked up. Um, so this is one, let's say, let's call it clip. Um, which has uh, velocities and pitch and durations and all kinds of things. This is 15 tracks, or 16, no, 12, actually. And um, each track could play a different clip, quantized, and there's an overall groove uh, editor, and there is some crazy shit which actually is not part of life, unfortunately, which allows to scramble the time. And there is something that allows to switch the patterns of each of these tracks in a timeline. So let's call this the arranger. And so that's a very basic step sequencer, which we used to, well, perform with. And it ran on a laptop, and it had MIDI out, and the MIDI went to, um, well, synthesizers, uh, synthesizer racks and stuff like that. And <clears throat> Some of those ideas, uh, in particular the idea that every single pattern can be switched at any time and that they can all switch together, um, found its way into life. And so parts of the inspiration for life came from, from trying out these things before. And also at this time that you were developing um, this step sequencer, you and Gerhard were also creating and performing music as well. Yes. As, uh, as Monolake. That's true. That is true. Um, so I think that this is a good point to perhaps listen to something from that era. I believe it's between like mid 90s to very early 2000s where uh, this PX18 step sequencer was really integral um, in the performance of your music. So let's have a listen to, I believe it was your first EP, Cyan. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So let's have a listen to Cyan 1, and um, then we can resume. So I, I think I have probably been listening to this track not for 15 years. So okay. let's, let's see if it stands up. But actually, this track is, is older than, than this here. So just to remind everyone what that was, that was uh, Cyan by Mono Lake from their first EP in 1997, I believe. So there's a few comments to make on that track. The first one is, <clears throat> it is very obvious if you listen to this um, all these years later, that at this time there was a different idea of time in the type of music which was made in Berlin. Uh, this idea of an endless state was very predominant and uh, because the first impulse when I listen to this now is, 
God, this is so slow. Um, but after listening to, uh, for it, to it for a while, I get back in the mental state which was happening during this time and the fact that things changed so slow was actually welcome because it was a very definite statement against a three minute pop track. So to wait till the change happens in your brain before it happens in the music. And uh, of course, uh, if you listen to this whilst you're being stoned, it's a different experience anyway. <laughs> and that played a role at this time, undeniably. Uh, this track is also a great showcase of uh, Gerhard performing the arpeggiator of the Juno 6. And um, the, this weird bass line is actually a mosquito. Um, I made a recording of uh, some flies um, for something and I just had this, this floppy with the mosquito in my sampler and we just transposed it down and suddenly this showed up and the bass line was there. Uh, this is the kind of experimentation which came very natural at this time. Uh, the, the, the byproduct was that there was all this annoying other birds in the background which uh, to me from a 2018 sound perspective are way too much in the foreground, but this was the trade-off, either having this mosquito bass line plus the uh, birds in the background or having not the mosquito bass line and the decision was clear, let's just accept the birds. And um, yeah, so much about this track. And um, the, the funny thing is that this track led to uh, our first release uh, on, on Chain Reaction simply because we were never intending to, to release this. We just played it to friends because we made tracks for ourselves, and for fun and for showing our friends. And one of our friends said, hey, um, did you play this to, to Mark and Moritz? And said, no, should we? Yeah, 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 you should. And then uh, I did. And I, I gave that, that, that tape to Mark. And I was expecting him to listen to it immediately. And it was kind of, okay. And Mark just put it in his bag. Ah, okay. And then nothing happened. And I forgot about it. And a few weeks later, Mark just um, called me on my landline because that was what we had this time and said, uh, w what's the name of your project? And I said, huh, sorry, what? Yeah, um, the dot you gave me. Um, what's the name of the project? And um, I were conferencing with Gerhard and we have been on, on a kind of holiday trip together uh, through the US and we went from uh, San Francisco to Las Vegas and we passed a sign to a lake but we didn't have time to see the lake and this was a lake called Mono Lake and we thought, oh, it's not interesting, and we just moved on. And then I went to a gas station, and I saw a postcard of Mono Lake, and I bought the postcard and went to Gerd and said, shit, look what we missed. And so when, we, when Mark asked us what the name of the project is, I look at Gerd, and Gerd looks at me, and we say, Mono Lake. <laughs> and <laughs> so the, the kind of lake we never saw. And um, so that's how uh, that happened. And it's, it's definitely worth clarifying who Mark and Moritz are. Mark and Estes okay, and Moritz yeah. von Oswald. Sorry, yeah. So, <laughs> small scene at this time. Everyone knew everyone. Uh, yeah, and Mark and Estes and Moritz von Oswald um, founded the, the basic channel label and Chain Reaction, which was the offspring of label, which became the, uh, the home of many uh, of our friends and in us. And this is how things happened. And this just shows how, how small everything was. Uh, it was very not driven by uh, big money, not driven by the idea of selling lots of copies uh, and not much marketing effort, actually no marketing at all, just the fact that it was existing and word of, word of mouth was enough to keep this running, to, keep, to get this running. Um, I'm also curious to know, like at this time, kind of late 90s, uh, Berlin, when Basic Channel, um, Chain Reaction, putting out these seminal releases. Um, what, what was your experience of performing around the city? Were, what kind of spaces were you moving within? Because I feel like uh, later on in your career, the idea of 
um, factoring in spaces becomes like one of the, the big tent poles of your um, approach to your work. So I'm curious to know what kind of spaces you were moving in at that time. That's a good question. Um, at, at this time, uh, when performing spaces were not my main concern. I was way too occupied with the fact that suddenly I, or we at the beginning, have to perform somewhere. So we just, when everyone, someone asked us, we, we went there and it was just the usual setup, some dudes on stage in a club. Um, there were some exceptions where we played uh, different scenarios with multiple speakers and things like this, but this was, it was not my main focus at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my interest in, in performing multi-channel uh, and finding a different perspective came later when, no, came later, period. Um, yeah. Okay, um, well, let's talk a little bit uh, further about the development of Ableton Live. Um, we've got another image, which... I'm so curious what comes now, <laughs> because I have a few <laughs> suspicions of which kind of images. Um, so we're going to look at number... Oop. No, you've lost it. Sorry, everyone. Let's look at number eight, please. Ah. Yes. This was actually functional. It doesn't look like this, but it worked. Um, so this is how a very, very early pre-version one release version of life looked like. Uh, and the funny thing is, if you look at this now, uh, you notice that the, the, the basic concept still looks very familiar, and I find this kind of cute. Um, and with a version that only looked slightly better than this one, we went to the first uh, NEM show, which is the most important trade show for electronic music instruments, and showed this software. And uh, yeah, I could talk a lot about this trade show and the reactions of the people to, to what they saw there. I don't know how much time we have. I think, I think it'd be great to share it, because now obviously NEM is a, it's a hugely um, important kind of location and event for kind of acoustic but also electronic instruments. Like what was it like taking this kind of new technology and presenting it to that kind of Just a, a question. Audience? Do you also intend to show this fantastic photo of Gerhard and me after the trade show? No, I didn't know it existed. Ah, too bad. Because um, there's a really hilarious photo of us. Uh, but if you don't have it, okay, even better. Um, so we, we went to NEM show and um, if you have not much money, then you are having a really small booth, like the size of, of that space here, pretty much the screen here in a smaller version and a little, um, little uh, thing to put a laptop on and show this and two loudspeakers. And not many people showed up at our place because we were in the, at the very end and next to us were some company who was sold some uh, really bad notation software and some strange company selling something else strange, which I forgot. And we showed this strange software which looked very different from anything people know, pe people knew at this time. This was the time when Reason just came out with this dangling cables and photorealistic renderings and three-dimensional stuff. And this was the opposite. And what happened was that people from other companies came by and said, sorry, what? This is a software you want to use on a laptop on stage? You guys are nuts. Um, laptop on stage. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and they left. And then other co company guys came and said, ooh, this interface looks horrible. Um, can't you hire a graphics designer? Um, and they left. Well, um, we were confident enough to survive that because at, at some point, well, first of all, we knew that laptops on stage work because we have been doing this. You have to imagine, just to give a context of the time, the, the typical advertisement for music software at this time looked like this. You have a full color photo page on, in Keyboards magazine with a photo of one of those studio mixing desks, which goes basically from this end of the room to that end. Um, 
and so you see this photo and leather and all very nice and I'm not making this up. I have this photo right in my memory and the Porsche car key on the on the desk. Um, this was the advertisement for Logic at this time. So um, the the image they wanted to convey for their software is this is professional software for the successful professional producer and the professional producer is a Porsche driver with a big console and a big studio. So that something that is on a laptop on stage for tech, techno nerds uh, doesn't fit in this image is obvious. Um, and this was our great chance because these customers were not recognized, this concept of performing was not recognized, this idea of actually making music as performance was not recognized. So we were the freaks and in our niche we were happy. Um, when we started Ableton, we kind of knew that we will sell enough copies that a small company can survive because we knew that our friends would be interested and that there's friends of friends of friends out there who share similar ideas. So we, we kind of knew that something like this fulfills a desire of people who try to make electronic music and who couldn't do the same way before. So we, we took that for granted. But what we didn't anticipate was that the market could be much larger. And what happened, and I'm, I think it happened on the second day of the first NAM show, was some guy came by um, a little bit older than us uh, and the usual LA style black uh, suit and everything in black and glasses, perhaps or not, I can't remember that. Uh, and he was followed by maybe five, six uh, significantly younger people also looking like the classical LA composers, also black, you know, like imagine um, Nine Inch Nails all over the place. And, and this guy said, um, so w what is this, what you have here? And I said, yeah, well, this is a software performing on stage and I can put in a loop here and I can change the tempo without changing the pitch and I can add a second loop and it runs in sync. And he interrupts me and says, so you can change the tempo without changing the pitch. So you can do this without steps in between. So I can maybe ramp up the tempo from, let's say, 110 BPM to 200 BPM continuously over two minutes. I said, yeah, sure, I can show you, clack, 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 clack. And I did from 30 BPM to 990, 99. And um, he says, oh, this is pretty cool. There's, you can't by any chance uh, combine this with Pro Tools. And the funny thing is, we kind of, in a, in a very um, smart move, from the very beginning implemented a protocol called Rewire. And Rewire allows to do exactly that, that you can connect any piece of software to uh, Pro Tools and run it as a slave. So I just said, yeah, sure we can, it has Rewire. Ah, oh, it has Rewire, nice. Um, and um, it was also, I believe, the first uh, music software that came out to run under OS X. So there were a lot of points for this person to be happy. And then this person left, and I was very uh, occupied with explaining this, this software to him, so I didn't really look at his name tag. Everyone has a name tag on the trade show. So I had my exhibitor name tag, and this guy had this name tag with a uh, um, visitor. And right before he left, I, I looked at his name tag, Hans Zimmer. And <coughs> So I thought, oh, okay, wow. Da, 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 uh, uh. So half an hour later, someone came by, said, hey, uh, I heard you have something interesting. Hans sent me. 35 minutes later, another person came by and said, hi, hey, hello. Um, can you tell me what you're selling here? What is, what is this software? And so basically, Hans Zimmer was really impressed. And if Hans Zimmer is impressed and is excited about something, he shares it with his other people. And the other people say, Hans uh, saw something exciting there at the very end, uh, this green little box there, you have to check it out. So suddenly all these people showed up uh, and we thought, hmm, maybe this thing we are doing here could also be interesting for people who are outside our primary focus. And um, that was one of the first points where we got an idea that perhaps we're doing something there that is a bit larger than what we anticipated. And then it, it grew like this over the years. And our biggest surprise for the first four or five releases was always that we were, every single time we went to the trade show, we thought, 
okay, now one of the big companies must have a product which is a perfect copy of that, but better. Because we were a small company with maybe 10 developers at the beginning, and a company like Apple or Steinberg or any of the, or Yamaha or whoever, any of the big companies could just say, okay, Department X, build a copy of that, but better. And this would have been the end of Ableton because, um, you know, with the marketing power and the, and the customer base of one of the big uh, hard or software players, they could just exceed what we have done by far. But they didn't because they still didn't see that this is a market. And um, at the point when they really realized it, it was too late because we, had, we were so established that everyone um, wanted to use live. And so that's the story. It's a great story. <laughs> So we're now at um, version 10 of Live. Like, to what has your um, involvement been in the development of these different iterations of it? Because um, I know that you have stepped back uh, from direct involvement with Ableton. So, like, what what has been your involvement through these various phases? Um, multiple. Uh, I've, I'm kind of well. Let's let's start with my current involvement because that's easier to explain. Uh, I'm in a very luxurious position. Uh, officially, I have the, um, the role of an external advisor, which means everything and nothing. Um, but practically, uh, I'm occupying myself with some details I find interesting or really important to focus on. Uh, some of the stuff which has to do with everything related to sound processing, sound uh, generation. I was involved in the wavetable synthesizer. I was involved with a few other uh, improvements of the effects. Um, this was always kind of my, my main domain officially, um, but I basically look at every single aspect of the software and talk with people about what I think is a good thing to improve, what I believe is going in the wrong direction, and basically try to, to put in my experience as someone who is using the software all the time and who is talking with millions of people, exaggerating, uh, 20 people about this software and observing how other people use it and where people fail um, and try to get this, this knowledge from the outside into the company and trying to, uh, on a level of small details, try to uh, improve things. And the other thing is that I'm of course part of this group who really thinks about what do we do for the next release, what do we do for the next five years. Um, so I'm always kind of navigating myself from the tiny detail um, of implementation of parameter ranges of colors of really anal detail because I'm one of those uh, to the great picture of saying um, we need to do more for people who want to do stuff that is not metrical music. I like to able to I like life to be able to handle odd rhythms and polymetric polyrhythmical stuff better than it does at the moment. Uh, is there anyone who is with me in this regard and can we allocate resources to that? Um, stuff like this. And, yeah. Um, as uh, Live has grown in popularity and become like um, almost ubiquitous, I suppose, in certain parts of electronic music, how has it sat with you, this idea of the Abletonification <laughs> of electronic music? Um, the idea that it has, well, okay, let me put it this way. It sounds like the initial um, impetus and the catalyst to develop these tools was to really revolutionize the idea of performance. Um, but I feel like Ableton in certain quarters has received criticism for restricting performance to a very standardized, I suppose, type of expression? Like, how does that sit with you? Uh, well, um, it's of course true. Uh, simply due to the fact that every instrument has a character. And it has to have a character, because there is no such thing as a neutral instrument. Um, and it makes a few things very easy to do. And it makes other things impossible or very hard to achieve. 
and it's in the very nature of people using instruments that the things which are easy and obvious are the things people do. Um, if you play a guitar, it's far easier to play uh, the chord progressions which are easy for your fingers um, than coming up with the most bizarre flamenco um, whatever. Um, sorry, I'm not a guitar player. Uh, but it doesn't keep anyone to, to, to move far, far away from what you do if you play guitar for a year. And I, I think electronic music software and hardware uh, in general made it very, very easy to achieve the, the standard because it took away a lot of the pain uh, we had in the beginning. Uh, the, the interesting question now is, if the computer makes all these things easy, what do we do as an artist? And the one solution is, let's make the same track everyone else made in five minutes, um, or I still spend four weeks or longer on a track and try to make something that is different despite the fact that the basics are simple. Um, <clears throat> and there's people doing it, and it's obvious. So uh, I, I think I never heard a a serious composer I admire um, complaining about the simplicity of tools because they are happy that basic things are simple and then they find ways to express themselves. Uh, if, of course it, it became much easier to, to have two loops running and sync together. But everyone now knows that having two beat loops running in sync is easy. So if you listen to a, a piece of music that contains two beat loops running in sync, you're not freaking out about the fact that they're in sync, because you know that this is simple. Uh, we got used to it. So we're expecting something um, more engaging, more interesting. Um, so I, it's in a way, if, if, if you compare it with photography, uh, a long time ago, it was much harder to make photos that had fantastic colors because it's a magical chemical process to make good color prints. Uh, nowadays, with um, state-of-the-art uh, CCD sensor chips in a cheap, uh, to, in a cheap camera, um, no one is amazed anymore by people uh, photos with nice colors. It's just a photo of nice colors. Uh, the internet is full of them. Um, but still, keep, people can make really, really interesting photos. You just need to find your own expression. And I see the same thing with life. Um, there's no shortage of using life in the most bizarre ways to create your own um, musicality. I mean, a funny thing is, in general, where I have personal problems with is when I, when I look at a synthesizer plugin and I play one note, and it plays back this whole complex series of things going on. Um, I feel lost as an artist because, you know, if I play a note and it's and there's a whole Richard Devine track coming out of one single note, um, where does this leave me with my inspiration? So I'm rather happy if I play a note and it's a sine wave and I need to play 500 notes to make something complicated. Uh, but of course, uh, then you enter the realm of professional music production a lot of the music which is made and a lot of the software which is sold and the hardware is sold to people who, well, make music for a living, like for commercials or whatever. And if you make a commercial uh, and the, the, the director is sitting behind you and says, I want this, you're not starting to say, okay, let me combine this sample of a pen falling down and let me put this in the key mark to time stretch it and, oh, we're already at the next cue, sorry. Um, how about, that's great, we take it. Uh, this is the reality of music production for a lot of people. So um, there is a, a feedback between the products which are offered and the demands of the market. So there is a market for creating instant amazing results. And this was the case when the first synthesizer came out with presets. Um, People didn't buy the DX7 because the synthesis algorithm was so amazing and everyone wanted to dive deep into the magic of FM synthesis. They bought the DX7 because, hey, you turn it on and here's my Rhodes and here is my flute and here is my tubular bells. That's why they bought it. The fact that probably you could have sold 95% uh, uh, of the DX7s without any capability of programming anything whatsoever. 
because people just used the thing which was right there. Um, it's only the few freaks who are trying to dive deep into their own expression. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like maybe this will be a, a nice segue into um, the next topic I want to talk about. Um, this idea of perhaps challenging yourself and challenging your modes of expression um, to not take the, the path most traveled is, um, if we can talk about your work with um, audiovisual installations and also with lasers. I mean, generally speaking, is this, um, are these types of ventures things that you've undertaken because it does present extra elements of uh, needing to engage your kind of engineer brain to solve these, these problems of how to express something artistically? <laughs> well, there is some, some truth in this assumption. Uh, first of all, I was always interested also in, in the visual side of artistic expression. I, at the same time, I discovered Jean-Michel Jarre. I was also running in museums and I always was looking at abstract painting, 20th century stuff. Uh, Dan Flavin, uh, you know, all kinds of things that were really simple, abstract, and powerful. Um, and when I started becoming part of the Berlin club scene, I spent an equal time uh, working on the decoration and illumination of the places which we explored. Um, and so the, the visual side was always an interest. It just never occurred to me until very late in my career that I could see myself as a audiovisual artist. It sounds strange in retrospective that I didn't see that, but I just couldn't see that being an artist, that calling myself an artist would be an option. That's a really, really funny thing. If you had asked me 10 years ago what I am, I would always say I'm an engineer. I would never say I'm an artist. Yeah, I make music, yeah, sure, but, and I sell records, yeah, sure, and I make perform live, yes, but artist, no. And uh, this is a kind of, uh, yeah, result of maybe an upbringing, result of education, result of lack of self-confidence, all these kinds of things. Uh, anyway, at some point in my career, I decided to, that I need to provide visuals to my music, mainly due to the fact that if I didn't, other people did, and the result was not good. I remember that something like in the early 2000s, it started with this VJ culture in, in, at clubs and festivals, and I was always allocated some random VJ when I was performing, so I was performing in my music, and at some point I looked behind me and I thought, uh, what is that? Uh, architecture mirrored, okay, uh, color circles mirrored, porn slash architecture again. Um, this has nothing to do with with my music, uh, this is arbitrary. And so my solution was, I wrote a little max patch to, do, to draw simple geometric shapes, so at least I, I understood that this is not cool, but it was at least better than having the, the randomness behind me. So that was kind of a first attempt to do audiovisual things, uh, but without any intention to turn this into an art form. This was more an uh, avoidance strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, then it happened that I ran into Tariq Bari uh, because I looked for a programmer who helped me with things and he offered me some help and it didn't work out but uh, he sent me some visual things he did at this time. That was something like uh, maybe 10 years ago. And I thought, hey, I shouldn't make videos, he should make video for me. So I knocked at his door and said, hey, do you like to go on tour with me? And he said, yeah, sure, why not? And so I gave away my, my visual aspirations to uh, Tariq, who is a genius. And completely independent from that, at some point I got asked to do something for, an for a gallery. I did sound installations before, multi-channel stuff which just run forever. This is something I did uh, already in the early 90s because I like this idea of music as an infinite continuum where you enter a space and music is running and you leave the space and it's still running. Um, in a way, sound installation and Berghain is the same, and club culture in general. Uh, this is the idea of an endless state, which you immerse yourself as long as you want. And in this regard, I perceive, for instance, going to Berghain not as much as going to a concert, but rather visiting an installation. So that's a nice art installation, and I'm participating in that. Um, the, so I got asked for a gallery to do some audiovisual stuff, and 
it just happened to me that I thought, why not working with, with a laser? I know how it works technically uh, due to my technical uh, curiosity, so I, I had an understanding what I could do in theory. And long story short, it didn't work out with this gallery, um, but this idea was seeded in my brain to work with lasers. Uh, and it was, it was an interesting idea in that way that when you were Googling laser show at this time, all you saw was really, really horrible thing. Uh, like green tunnels, really che cheesy animations of company logos in all colors turning around. Uh, nothing was precise, nothing was clear, nothing was structured, nothing had rhythm. Everything was exactly not what I, want, what I, wa what I would have wanted. This is complicated. <laughs> Everything was not what I wanted. So, and that opened the door to, for me to say, okay, let's, let's try if I can turn this into something different. And um, then I kind of got uh, hooked on this medium because it's so limited. The, the interesting thing with, and also the fact is, there is so much excellence out there in the audiovisual domain, especially when it comes to doing video pixel-based graphics. There's people doing amazing stuff. Uh, if you just think about what Tarek Vari does, what Johnny Le Mercier does, what uh, millions of, well, again, millions, billions of billions, what a lot of other people do out there. Um, and I thought it's pointless for me to try to compete with them because that's not my main expertise. And, but if I use a very limited medium, which forces me of, to think of the core of rhythm and structure, um, then I have a chance to apply my ideas of composition in the, to the audio-visual world. And that's why I decided that lasers are interesting. And all I do with my lasers is either trying to explore generation of shapes um, at the edge of what the medium is capable of doing, or exploring rhythmical successions of simple things. And both are very close to how I think about music. So in a way, working with my lasers is exactly the same type of thinking than composing music. And as a matter of fact, everything is driven by uh, pretty much max patches, so it's even the same technological background. Uh, to, to give you an idea about why working with lasers is such a puzzle, such a difficult thing to do, is it, how it works is you have one laser source, which is just a super sharp beam of light and you have two tiny mechanical mirrors, and one mirror moves the beam up and down, and the other mirror moves the beam left and right. And then, of course, you can turn on and off the laser, and if, if you have three different colors, then you can mix the colors, but that's basically it. It's all mechanical. It's really archaic. And if you want to draw a line, well, you just move one mirror back and forth, back and forth, and you get a line if you do this fast enough. If you want to have a circle, you move the two mirrors, one with a sine wave, the other with a cosine wave, and you get a circle. You do this 20 or 30 times or 100 times per second, and your eye is so slow that you see a nice circle and not one beam moving around. Uh, so drawing one circle is very simple. Drawing two circles is a completely different issue because you draw one circle, then you stop, and you turn the laser beam off. Then you move whilst the laser beam is off with the mirror to one point in the second circle. Then you turn the laser back on. Then you start drawing the second circle. Then you turn the laser back off. You go back to somewhere in the first circle, you repeat this. And you do this constantly, nonstop. And that means the, the mathematics uh, behind that is for two circles is significantly more complex than for one circle. And if you want to do this with six circles moving around, um, you get all kinds of complexities going on. And so everything is a challenge when working with lasers. And everything is difficult. And that means you start really uh, embracing simple shapes. And you start thinking about timing a lot. Square, square, square. Darkness. Square. <laughs> <laughs> and <coughs> this, this becomes satisfying. You would never do this with video because it would be so... It wouldn't, it wouldn't feel right because it would feel too simple. But with these intense bright laser beams, these things become meaningful. And so I use a simple medium uh, and try to do something meaningful with it. And this also in, in times where electronic music is so full of abundance, 
Uh, I can choose between millions of sounds all the time. I can layer 10,000 of sounds uh, on my laptop. Working with a medium where everything is tedious uh, clears my head because there is no sense of, yeah, I just add five more circles. And uh, no, you can't. You work with this single, single line of light until it feels right. And this is a great exercise in simplification and in rhythm and in, in uh, shapes. I think we should definitely take a look at some of this work that you've been talking about. Um, what we're going to play is video number two, and I chose this one. Um, this is a work of yours called Fragile Territories, which oh, I believe nice. was from 2012. And the reason I chose it is because uh, a year or two years ago, here at the Funkhouse during Loop uh, Festival, it was uh, installed in a room upstairs. So I thought that that would be a really nice, a really nice kind of tie-in. Um, so if we could play a little bit of that now. So um, all you see now, that's four beams of light. So um, all the shapes you see is just four lasers moving around. And this piece is nice because it only works uh, due to the imperfections of the technology, which is always an interesting thing to explore. Uh, and this is something no professional laser show would allow to do, because this is where the professional laser show would always say you can't do this with these machines. Um, and if I write my own software, I can say I embrace the fact that there's problems. So what you're going to see is you see vertical and horizontal lines. These are programmed. And you see all the lines which are not exactly vertical and horizontal are the results of the mechanical mirrors moving um, the shortest possible path from one step to another. And this is the things which normally in a professional laser show you would turn off the laser beam. Um, but I'm not turning them off, I expose them, and well, you will see what happens. That was Fragile Territories. <laughs> Would it, would it be possible to have a still of, of this display? Challenging the technical people. Oh, fantastic, cool. Um, the uh, few things I'd like to add, if you have time for about this. The, the one thing is that this is huge, uh, which is a, a property of lasers which makes a lot of fun. I can draw this as large as I want. Um, so a person would be, would be dead. Um, so my, my hand is a person. And <clears throat> this is pitch black, because unlike video, there's just no beam of light. So this is pitch black, and this can be really, really bright. Uh, and this is something that, of course, in a, in a video doesn't show like this. The, um, here I did something that I came up with per accident. Uh, <clears throat> this is an orange uh, laser beam. Basically, the laser beam moves here, and at some point, defined by some mathematical function, I turn on a second laser beam inside the laser, which is orange, and I superimpose this orange line here. So th this is all black and white, and there's one orange thing moving around, uh, which I found kind of cute. It's a purely aesthetic decision has no further meaning apart from the fact that I liked it. Uh, you saw this, this black shadow moving there, and that's an interesting one, because as I told you, this is basically four lasers doing stuff, and they overlap, because unlike video, with lasers you never have a defined, uh, well, you have a defined size, but with video it's very clear, here's a pixel, here's a pixel, this is the end of the screen you would not draw something on this screen that is only this size, because that would be a waste, and you can certainly not draw anything here. With lasers, it's always a negotiation between speed of drawing and size. And that means <coughs> um, I can deliberately draw, for instance, larger than a screen, or I can get very small. And what happens here with those four lasers is that one important aspect of this work was that I wanted to deliberately hide the fact that this is four lasers so that they are all communicating with each other in such a way that this becomes one uh, unified shape, which is technically a challenge. And as a first test, if this can work at all, I created this simple blanking pattern where I'm just turning the lasers on and off step by step, 
um, basically as a test if they run in sync. So I programmed an earlier version of this, and then I added this, this black shadow just as a test signal. And at some point, after a lot of adjustment, it felt really like this one black shadow moving through. And then I was happy, test achieved, and I turned the, it off. And then something interesting happened psychologically. I thought, hmm, it looks flat. It looked far cooler with the shadow. So I understood that this shadow is an important part of the work. It just happened via exper experimentation. So I gave the shadow a mess. And I gave it a mess by applying this <laughs> sound. This has eight channels of sound. So when the shadow moves here, this low noise swoosh follows the shadow. So if you're standing here and the installation is here, you really have the sound following the shadow, like the sound of a black blade uh, actually going in front. And again, unlike video, if this black shadow moves here, it's really pitch black. You can't distinguish it from someone actually manually blocking the beam. So people really believe that someone is manually blocking the, the beams. Um, and I did some other interesting detail there. You hear these high-pitched sounds, and <clears throat> they are also distributed all over the installation. And whenever the black shadow comes, I'm slowly, uh, I'm, I'm slightly removing the high frequencies, just as if someone's standing in front of the speakers, the, the high frequencies are gone. And I do the same thing with the black shadow. And this makes this black shadow even more physical. So the experience is there is a, an evil black object in front of that. And, well, that's kind of how it happened. The other thing is that when I do such things, <clears throat> time becomes a very important point. Uh, I spend a lot of time inside my installations, which are all running on max patches, uh, and fine tune the the shape, the, the change over time. How long can be something that is static? When does it need to change? You can't test this really on a small screen or in a small setup in an atelier space. You have to test it in a large space. So I'm sitting there and I observe how, how long can one situation stay? When is it too long? When it needs to change? And then I adjust it till it feels right in a, in a, a specific space. And then the next day when the opening is, I observe the people and I check it again with the people. And then I might even fine tune it again. So all this work uh, always um, gets its final shape uh, in collaboration with the audience in a way. It's pretty much like when you make music and you uh, f almost finish a track and then you play it to your best friends and you notice, ah, oh, this part here, this is too short, this part is too long and you change it. And I do the same with those installations. So they, they always are finished basically on the, the next day after the opening <laughs> before I leave. Thank you for that. That was, that was a fantastic um, explanation. Um, I'm gonna show a couple more uh, photos. Uh, if we can have a look at number 15. Uh, any moment uh -huh. now, and it looks like this is in the studio. And I believe that this is uh, working on the laser installation for the From Within show. Okay, um, yeah. so this is um, <laughs> no lasers this time. This is just a bunch of LEDs, and this is my atelier space, which I have since half a year, and which makes it possible for me to try large-scale things without turning my living room into a workspace. Uh, Sometimes it's funny how long it takes uh, from an idea to reality. So I'm working with lasers since 10 years. And since half a year, I have a, a, a space which actually allows me to do it. Before that, I did it in my living room. Uh, don't ask me why I didn't uh, get a space earlier. Anyway, so yeah, this is LED sticks, which is, again, a very limited technology. This is 85 pixels. 48 sticks uh, in one row and uh, 2 times 24 sticks in another row. And this is part of the stage design for the uh, From Within concert, which will happen on Thursday, which is a collaboration between me and a <coughs> composer called Marko Nikodijevic, who is writing for Ensemble and does things I have no clue about. And I learn a lot from him every single day. And um, yeah, those LED sticks are in use 
as a visual component together with the composition. And there is a few things here which are uh, kind of important to perhaps to mention. The spacing of these LED sticks is a random spacing uh, because I deliberately didn't want to have a regular grid like everyone because everyone is doing regular grids. So I thought, let's do something irregular. But of course, the software completely knows the placement of every stick. So even when the spacing is irregular, I can do regular movements within these spacings. But the visual appearance is different. There is some interesting rhythm going on here just because of the spacing of the LEDs. And <clears throat> it's very low resolution, so it's the opposite of a uh, high resolution video screen. And um, it's RGB and it can dif do different colors. And this is Selma, uh, intern at this time, who is a pretty good touch designer programmer and helped me a lot. This is Ableton Live running on one computer. This is Max running on a different one. And this is a so-called email client. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's it. Well, the next photo, uh, which is number 16, which is uh, seeing uh, this LED construction so this, in action. This, unfortunately not. This is a mock-up. Um, oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the reality does slightly look similar. Uh, this is, in my dream world, how it's supposed to look like. Um, but there's maybe there's some, something more to talk about. Um, so these are actually the real musicians, so these faces you will see on Thursday. Uh, <clears throat> this part here, this black monolith here, is 48 nice little loudspeakers. And <clears throat> usually the, the scenario for concerts is you have a line array, like a lot of speakers here on the right, and you have a lot of speakers here on the left. And the problem is, if you really like the sound of these um, 30 people performing, uh, the sound from the cello comes from here, and it has a specific radiation pattern. And the sound from uh, these gongs come from here and have a different pattern. And every musician has a has a place on stage. And then comes some electronic sound and it comes from here blasting and from here. It's, it's completely disconnected. And what happens very often is in such events that you put microphones on all the musicians so that the musicians come also from here, which effectively kills all the spatial pla placement of the orchestra and turns the orchestra into a recording of an orchestra. So <clears throat> if you really don't want to do this and you say, I want to experience a world-famous orchestra just as it was experienced 100 years ago, um, or as it can be experienced with any composition that involves no electronics, you can't just have two speakers left and right. And <clears throat> this is when I thought, how about having 48 speakers and using, uh, <laughs> yeah, we come to the, the, how I manage that in a second. Uh, Sometimes having an idea and making it happen works out. Uh, so 48 speakers here and a technology called wave field synthesis, which I don't want to go into detail. Uh, the main point of it is you can use this technique to create some really strange sound effects inside the audience. And you can use this technique to get a very convincing, very deep uh, sound field that makes you forget about the fact that they're speakers. Plus, of course, it looks cool. It looks kind of monolith 2001-ish. Uh, I had this idea that I would like to do that. And of course, this is way too expensive. And it just happened that I had an interview with uh, <clears throat> someone who is doing marketing for a loudspeaker manufacturer I really admire, DNB Audio Technik in near Stuttgart. They built some of the best uh, PA systems on this planet. And <clears throat> I just called this guy and said, we had this nice talk recently, and I have a completely crazy idea. I, I just want to share this idea with you. M maybe DNB has can help me a little bit. And um, to my great surprise, they said, wow, this, looks, this sounds really cool. Um, we're working on a new processor for controlling a lot of speakers at the same time. Uh, that would be a perfect test case for that. So, um, it happened that they offered to, <clears throat> to provide this speaker system 
for the premiere in Paris and for this event here uh, in Berlin, basically for free. And uh, this is something that made me pretty speechless. And um, I found it very remarkable because this is really something that is not uh, justified by marketing efforts. Uh, this is really something that people do because they are genuinely interested in making this happen. And we had some tests at their facility and especially the tests with these virtual sound sources in front of the speakers. And the person who was mainly responsible for um, the sponsoring was just standing there and said, this is unbelievable. This is, it, it really works. And he was, he was just like a little boy and was fascinated by that. And this is the, the moments where I'm extremely happy about what I can do. Because very often I'm in a situation where I meet people who have the same excitement, who, who do the things they do because of the love for what they're doing, and not because uh, someone told them to do or because they think about a big investment. Of course, at some point you think about what does it cost, can we do it? But very, very often the motivation for doing things is, I have a great idea, let's see how we can make it happen. And this, this general attitude is what I experience just very, very often when working with people in the field of electronic music, in this type of audiovisual festivals. Um, there is a spirit here that is, is driven by, and still is after all these years, by the, the desire to make something cool happen. And so I, I hope this is going to be cool in Berlin. We are still working on it. Uh, it's an enormous amount of effort. And there were elements of the premiere in Paris which we were not happy with because uh, it would need much more time than we had. It's always like this, never, never is there enough time, but you need deadlines anyway. So it's kind of always a, a fight. And we had a similar fight and still have for Berlin. I, right after this talk here and after my interviews, I go back and continue working. And then I continue working tomorrow. And then we set up and we will see how far we go with that. But there's also moments in it where I feel a sense of achievement. And a last note about Marco. Marco is a composer. OK, I never obviously learned compose, composition. I'm completely self-taught, and I know synthesis inside out. Um, my musical skills came from listening and from um, trying things out. I have a tiny little bit of music theory background, but um, everyone who has just basically probably one music theory lesson will beat me in that. Uh, Marco is a classical trained composer who is started to study composition when he was 15, he's 38 now, and this is what he makes his living of. And working together with someone with that background, uh, who at the same time goes to Berghain and has a profound knowledge about Ableton Life, uh, is a blessing. Because uh, work with him over the last year or so very much changed my perspective on essential musical aspects like form, like reason for things. It's not so much about writing for a cello or a flute or extended playing techniques for oboe. It is about why is this note at this position in time? And why is this phrase repeating for four bars? This should be five bars. Um, and then you can explain why. And you listen to the explanation and it makes sense. Um, this is something that very much changed my perspective on music and very much changed my perspective on how I will compose in the future. And so for me, the, the outcome of, of this specific uh, collaboration is, is two sides. The one is the, the actual concert, where I hope that we will be satisfied, but I'm not 100% convinced, simply because the, the difficulty of it and the lack of time. And the other thing is that this whole collaboration changed my perception of my own work in such a way that I profoundly believe that I will make different types of music afterwards. So it will still be my music, of course, and it will be still my ideas of sounds and of rhythm of shapes, but uh, I will much more focus on, on, on overall form and 
on overall reasoning between this block comes here and then this block there and this block there and why is there repetition and why is there a change here and this is the, the, the part which I tremendously enjoy about collaboration that you suddenly are confronted with a person who has profound knowledge about something you have no knowledge about and at the end of the day you learn something and the other person learns something too and you come up with something that ideally is bigger than what every person can do by itself. And this brings me back to the very beginning. The, the reason why my, my friendship with Gerhard Beles is so important is because we are, we are so different. And Gerhard very often thinks exactly the opposite of what I do. And then we need to discuss. And once we come to an agreement, we can be quite certain that we are on the right track. Um, and this is why I didn't like this guy at the beginning in Munich when I met him first. And this is why I tremendously enjoy uh, every moment I can uh, have with him these days. Because he is not a person who always says, oh yes, that's a great idea. But who is really questioning my uh, input and at the same time finds it equally important that I question his input. Because also interesting, he says, the problem is if you're in a certain position like the CEO of a company, it's far too likely that people don't question your things because, hey, he's the CEO, <laughs> you know? And I'm in a position where I can, and I am allowed to, to say, are we really sure that this is a good idea? And so that was the, the circle to the beginning of this Ableton thing. Well, I think um, speaking of collaboration, this is probably a nice moment to play one last track um, from this record uh, called Pan. I was going to play um, Enmos, but I think we should flip it over and play the track that uh, you co-produced with Electric Indigo. But Enmos uh, is actually the track I like more. Okay, well, let's play that. I mean, it's already... It it's queued up, it's already on 45, so... Uh -huh. <laughs> Funny thing is, uh, on my early records, there was never a... Uh, a hint if it's 33 or 45, because the whole philosophy was, well, whatever works for you works. And I experienced a few times that I went to a place and they played a the track with the wrong speed. And my first attempt, my first initial impulse is going to DJ and say, uh, it's 33. Um, and my second uh, impulse is, sounds good this way. So, um, I like the idea to, the concept of a track is something that is made for people to play with. And um, this is a, a Technics Quartz SL1200 one, two, Limited um, in gold. Feels pretty much the same as the normal one. Um, but it's gold. It's a <clears throat> so that was uh, Enmos by so Mona Lake. Th that's a, a funny experience to listening to this one because uh, I perform the material of, of this track very often live, and I haven't heard to this track since basically I did it. And since when I perform live, I always change things, this now is in a completely different state. It still has the same sounds, but the structure and the mix and everything is far, far away from that. And uh, I would never edit it like this anymore after playing it for one and a half years. The, <clears throat> the, the things which I still like on this one is there's this synthetic kind of uh, voice saying something like sin or sid or whatever it, this is. And this is uh, a, a spoken word, like indeed the word sin, uh, re resynthesized on a historical piece of equipment, the, the synclavier which once was the most expensive machine money could buy uh, and is a technological masterpiece and milestone of the early 1980s. Um, and due to the fact that in the early 2000s, no one was interested anymore in digital hardware synthesizers, uh, people threw away a lot of fantastic digital equipment for almost nothing because they believe that computers can do everything. And I got my hand on one of those nice uh, 
machines um, for a very low price, and then I spent a lot of money to actually get it working. Um, but a lot of the sounds on this record uh, have been made with this machine. And the, the interesting part for me about this machine is that it combines a, a very rough type of synthesis uh, that sounds very outdated with something that is still feels futuristic. And I have a nice kind of personal relationship to this whole system. It's a, it's a true music computer from a different era. It's a, it's a big rack which only contains the computer system. Um, it has an external computer screen, green on, on, on blue, and a keyboard, and everything is super slow. And um, it feels like uh, the future of 30 years before. And when I work with this machine, then I have to get used to the pace of it. So all these operations are slow. You type in a command, you see the text building up again, and then you type the other command, and you see the text building up again. So it kind of enforces a certain mental state. And uh, to me, this mental state is something I really enjoy when working with it, because every single result I get becomes, again, important. So I create some variation, I type in a few numbers, and I get a new sound. And instead of immediately deleting it, I listen to it a few times because maybe it is good. And um, yeah, so much about, about this. I think as a, a final question before we open it up to the floor, um, it's interesting hearing you talking about this and talking about your work with lasers. And I, I'm interested in this concept of you um, working in situations where there are limits um, where it's not just like a boundless uh, plane of experimentation, where you're kind of giving yourself restrictions and giving yourself limits. And I, I watched a talk that you did where it was literally called Gimme Limits. Um, and I think it might be really interesting for the participants here um, to hear from somebody who has your long history as an artist, as an engineer, as a technologist, also as an academic, um, about perhaps the benefits of enforcing limits or including limits in your creative process? Well, I, I guess most of it, at least in between the lines I, I mentioned already, the, whenever you want to create something, the, the process of creation is a process of exclusion. You exclude ideas. So you have 88 keys on a piano, you choose a scale. You remove some keys. Uh, you have only maybe 10 fingers, so you don't play more than a few notes at the same time. Um, you have a limit of the speed of your fingers, so you play only a limited number of notes over a period of time. So everything is, every artistic occupation in a way is limiting. Or you, you write a book, you, you find a topic which finding a topic is not here is the, the big empty void and then there's a topic. Finding the topic is here is all the possible topics of the world which I ignore to use this topic. So it's the opposite of this idea of there's nothing and then the artwork comes up. It's there's everything and I remove and I remove and I remove and here's the artwork. Just like the bass drum there is, is actually on this record. There's too much bass drum. There needs to be a break in between. And the bass drum itself sometimes has too many high frequencies going on. It would be better if it would be less. So as a matter of fact, with a distant view on my own work, I would reduce it even further. Um, because I believe it would be more to the point if it's more reduced. And then it opens up space for something else. So I could make a few elements louder. Um, and then this whole thing would be more convincing, at least is my own perspective to that now when I listen to it again. Uh, <clears throat> so it's always a, pr a process of, of reduction. It's always a process of how little can you do and still be convincing. And then within this little thing, you, get the, you open up the space for, for moving things around. It's basically you create space. So by removing uh, topics, you can go deeper into one topic. By removing elements in a composition, you have more freedom to actually arrange them in time, because they're not covered by other elements. Uh, 
just as a, as a thought experiment. If all you have is a bass drum, so imagine you have five minutes and you have just a bass drum and nothing else. You would not do for five minutes, bang, 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 bang. Because you have to be creative with that. So you start thinking about every possible combination of rhythmical things you can do with this bass drum. It's a fantastic exercise, actually, if you think about it. Uh, five minutes, just a bass drum, make a song. Um, of course, if you have a huge song, then you can have for five minutes bass drum going straight forward to the floor because there's all the other elements. So the more you remove, the more every single element becomes a challenge. And um, that's kind of cool. Another exercise which I gave my students when I was teaching uh, and got some amazing results was, so I was teaching at a department which also was concerned with audiovisual stuff. Imagine you make a movie and you have 25 pixels. So every single frame has 25 pixels and you only have 25 frames. So your whole movie is 25 things of 25 pixels and each pixel can only be on and off. This is extremely limited. But actually you can arrange these 25 pixels in any way you want. So you can make one, uh, one line of 25 pixels, you can have five to five pixels. And students were able within these 25 frames, so you can draw this movie on a, on a sketchbook in, in lunch break, um, you can make a, a whole story of the creation of the world and love and hate with nothing but 25 blocks of black and white stones. And um, this is really cool to figure out that you can be super emotional even with something as limited as, uh, like this. So you know, you imagine there's one black dot showing up in the first frame on the first, on the left. There's another frame, another black dot showing up on the right. Um, they move towards each other. At some point, when the first one moves two steps at, at some point, the other one steps back to the very end. You're at the beginning of a story. These are two things which interact with each other. And um, they can meet and suddenly everything can become flickery. Um, that could be interpreted as whatever you want, you know? And you can tell stories. And I, I find this really fascinating, how, how you can become creative with the, the least amount of, of elements. And if you go back to electronic music, where you have the ability to shape every single of these elements to be the most beautiful, shiny, shiny element ever. So going back to the bass drum example, if you really want to have this one bass drum for five minutes, there's nothing wrong with shaping this bass drum for two days till it's the perfect sounding bass drum, which actually you enjoy listening to over small speakers, big speakers, gigantic speakers. Um, and so in a way, I try to, to keep this thinking alive that I try to achieve something with very limited amounts and not get caught away by this very easy route of just adding more to, to feel comfortable. Um, so reduction is the most difficult thing to achieve, I guess. Well, I hope we've managed to achieve scratching the surface. Um, thank you so much for being here. Please, everybody, give Robert Hanker a huge thank you. Um, so at this point, we're going to open up questions. Um, don't be shy, put your hand up. If you, yep, we've got one over here already. <laughs> Hello. Oh, that's so loud. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for sharing the whole experience. I mean, I find it very, very ins inspiring how passionate you are about all the stuff you talk about. It, it is inspiring for a lot of us who are upcoming musicians, producers, and some of us hopefully artists too. So my question is, since you talk a lot about art and how art works and how your art works, I wanted to know your opinion about how, what do you think about art now? What do you think the state of art, how do you think, how do you think, uh, what do you think about how art is now and where is it going? I just want to know well, that. that. That seems to be a, a very broad thing because I have a hard time even defining what art is. So Yeah, well, what about, for example, installation art? Just, let's, 
yeah, let's reduce the topic since we were talking about reducing it. Uh, <laughs> let's reduce and let's just talk, for example, about installation art. And I, I just meant, for example, um, uh, for example, well, probably the question is, um, oh, sorry, my English. Uh, probably a little bit influenced about what I think about art night nowadays, but I, for example, I think that some of the art is just like, I don't know, random stuff, and some other is just like very reducing, reducing it against some stuff is, are very valuable, so I, I don't know, I wanna know your opinion about that, and of course, I don't know about installation art, because you talked a lot about it, and of course it is something important in what you do, so I wanna know what you think about that. Well, um, I guess <clears throat> the, the, the whole field of these type of things I'm doing, uh, for me, the, the, more, the most difficult question is where do I see myself or the, the value of the work I do in a larger context? So uh, I, I, I might take your question as a, a starting excurse to something that I'm occupying myself a lot with that has to do with the question of where is the art going. Uh, when I made electronic music in the early 90s, it was very clear that this is not commercial. Um, this is underground, which means it doesn't take much money to do it. There is no large audience and it has no resonance in a larger uh, scale. Very early then what happened was that for instance with the advent of drum and bass which I very much liked and still do, um, suddenly you saw drum and bass under car commercials because this type of more melodic upbeat music fit very well with this kind of agency vibe of the future. Um, and the same thing happens in an even faster evolution with this, all this digital media stuff these days. Uh, whatever adventurous underground idea you can come up with, how to use mapping, LED pixels, lasers, uh, video, glitch, uh, whatever it is, you are just one centimeter away from the next big com uh, agency who is doing exactly the same with the same ideas for Volkswagen, Audi, uh, Tesla, whatever. Uh, so, and they appropriate these ideas, but with a different uh, approach to it. The, the approach there is, of course, not this has to be meaningful and this, is a, this has to be personal because that's not what the, what the interest is. Uh, it needs to be impressive. Uh, this is the, the, the currency is impressiveness. Is, yeah, let's cover all this building with LED screens and have something amazing interactive going on. Um, it's cool as long as it looks cool. It doesn't have to have any meaning. It doesn't have to have any artist, art historical context or it doesn't need to point to the future. It just needs to be cool. And as someone who is working in this field, sometimes I, I struggle with this, with this scenario because um, on one side I'm this cool famous person who is one of the co-inventors of Ableton Life. On the other side, I'm running a very, very small scale uh, artistic thing where I solder my LEDs by myself and I'm happy with 8,160 RGB pixels. Um, whilst uh, the others have a budget 10 times or 100 times higher to cover the whole room. Uh, how do I deal with that? And I, I deal with this by trying to convince myself that the point is not having the most impact, the point is doing something that is personal. Um, because at the end, this is why I do art because I want to express myself. So I don't know where the general art world is going and I don't know um, who will be the upcoming star of digital media arts and whose uh, LED sculptures will be worth uh, 10 millions in five years. 
uh, I'm pretty sure mine won't, uh, which is fine. Um, but I don't know about the rest of the development. Uh, I guess the whole point is, if you're an artist, at some point you need to free yourself from caring about this too much. Because at the end of the day, if you don't do what you do because you like it and maybe your five best friends, then you are lost anyway. Uh, I find it far more important that the people who are really around me can relate to what I'm doing than this, this big mess. And this reminds me to an experience I made a few years ago, which I found in retrospective very important. Uh, after Gerhard stopped making music with me, I was in a, because he had no time anymore, I, I was in a position where I was very insecure. And I was invited to play a show in a, one of the really big clubs in London. And at this time, this still meant a lot to me. And I was really very, very nervous about that. And I thought, this kind of music which I do is strange anyway. And so I tried to deliver a set that was a little bit more upfront. So um, I had my best intentions. My best intention was a Saturday night and I need to deliver. And I played this set which was, well, a bit more techno and more mainstream than what I would do usually. And the people were dancing and the organizer was happy. So everything was cool. The next day, I read on a message board uh, of a forum I was reading, I was so incredibly disappointed by the Monolake show yesterday. If I want to hear boring, generic techno, I can go anywhere. I wanted to, do a, I wanted to listen to a Monolake show. This was completely bullshit. And I was reading this and it was like, an, it hit me really right in there. Because I knew immediately that this person was right. I, I kind of tried to sell my soul out of insecurity. And probably if I have done just playing back what I would usually do for my friends, maybe not 95% of the drunken people there who wouldn't care about the music would have been that happy. But these 5% or 10% or who knows, 30% of the people who deliberately came to see me would have been much, much more happy. And um, that was a big lesson I learned there. And since that time, I really try always just to do what I can do best and focus on that. Even when I risk sometimes that the majority of the audience might not appreciate it. I mean, it happens sometimes that you are booked to a place and you know beforehand or you know at the moment you arrive that you're going to have a tough night here because the, the, the promoter obviously didn't listen to what you're doing and the audience will not like it. What you do in such a moment is you look out for the five people in the audience who you assume who will like it and you focus on them. And the moment you start playing, you look in their eyes and you smile at them and you wait for them to smile back at you. And the whole, whole concert you deliver to them. And this always works, because they will immediately notice that this is happening for them right now, and then don't care about everyone else. Because even if everyone else afterwards will go away and will not be appreciative of what you're doing, these five people will come to you at the bar and say, oh, thank you, man. And it's, you're, you're good. So that's the, the thing to take home. Um, I had a, a, a question regarding Ableton. Um, I, I guess it kind of concerns the creativity and limitations idea that you were talking about as well. Uh, so I, I'm an Ableton user. I have a friend who's also a producer and he's a Logic user. And we have constant, endless debates that are really fun about which, you know, about the differences between the DAWs and the different capabilities of each. And I was just wondering what are, because obviously there's a huge amount that Ableton can do that other dollars can't, and there's some things other dollars can do that Ableton can't. So what, what are the influences, like what makes you kind of make the decision, we're going to be able to do this, and we're going to focus on this, and we're not going to have 
is it that you, like you don't want to be like Ableton isn't really concerned with being you know one particular thing and you have an idea of like what exactly you want it to be is it like that or is it just uh, this is a, a very very difficult question and uh, since the, the company is now quite matured and old uh, and also reasonably large there is a lot of people discussing these topics it's not this kind of super hierarchical um, top-down thing and uh, you also learn that you do some marketing research and you talk to people and you talk to people from different cultural backgrounds, from different musical backgrounds and you try to to boil all these external influences and your own ideas into a meaningful uh, guideline of what to do next. So it's always a mix of listening to your customers, listening to other customers who don't like your product, that's equally important, um, and listen to your own ideas and try to come up with, uh, with conclusions. At the beginning, the answer was simple. We did something where we had experience in. So we knew how to make a software that works for people who want to make the type of music we like. So the decisions were easy. None of us could read a score, so um, the idea of implementing a musical notation was very far out. That's the simple, most basic reason why in life there's no musical notation. No one has a clue. Nowadays, things are of course different, but the question is how many of our users would rely on musical notation and how many other users of us would actually rely on other things which we can improve. Uh, the, there is no shortage of ideas, there's no shortage of wishes internally, there's tons of pages of things which we like to do. There's a severe limitation of uh, actually development time. So as a matter of fact, if someone watching this now on YouTube and you are a C++ developer and you want to relocate to Berlin and work for a really nice company with a lot of cool people and shaping the music software of the future, write us an email. So, commercial end. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm serious about this. Uh, we could do a lot more with more developers, but everyone needs developers, so they uh, are really rare. Um, and we compete with companies like Google who can pay a shitload more and um, offer a lot of things um, a company of, the, of even of the size of Ableton can't. Uh, the, the decision making process these days becomes also more complicated due to the fact that the, the whole market situation is changing a lot. Uh, for 20 years we could rely on 20, yeah, almost. For almost 20 years you could rely on the laptop is the thing. Nowadays you already notice that there's a whole generation of people who thinks laptop, that's the stuff my parents are using. Um, <clears throat> so here's my iPhone, show me something that I can do with my iPhone. Uh, every, every software company, not only music software, but of course also music software has to face the fact that these things are the stuff the parents are using. And uh, so a lot of development resources already have to go into thinking about what products do you offer when the laptop is not hip anymore. Uh, this alone takes an enormous amount of resources. Um, you see that <clears throat> in general people who years ago abandoned hardware uh, to do all on a computer screen, suddenly buying all these little boxes which do cool stuff. So there is another change where people like hardware and where people expect that hardware is doing a lot of their cool work. Um, then you have things like uh, mastering services, which means you don't need to go to a mastering studio anymore. The next step in this uh, thought chain is perhaps the classical way of mixing tracks is also at some point a thing of the past. If an algorithm is better in mixing my tracks, um, then I don't need to mix tracks anymore. But maybe this even would imply the classical idea of tracks 
is not existing anymore. So you can start thinking in a lot of ways that seem to be completely from a different planet, from a 2018 perspective, but maybe from a 2025 perspective looks like the way you make music in 2025, if you are state of the art, has nothing to do anymore with this concept of this is my bass drum track, this is my hi-hat track. Who knows? I'm not saying that this will be the case. I'm just saying that this is something to think about now, because if you think about it in five years, it's too late. So uh, if you think about all these questions, and on top of the question of just making sure the software does all these little improvements which you want to have, um, and as the list is endless, uh, uh, people love the comping feature in uh, Logic. Uh, life has no nice comping. It's something I personally don't care a lot, but there's a lot of producers who do classical music production, like classical pop production, who really require that feature to happen. So you have to allocate resources to this. Um, and then we have some crazy ideas what we can do uh, in the reality of um, something more with the session view, which is beyond what's possible now. So there's, there's all kinds of ideas. And the, really the big difficulty is figuring out which of these ideas can realistically, realistically be included in an upcoming release. And you always have to make a, a balance between you need to deliver something that people really want to get their work done. So that's the bread and butter stuff. If you, don't, if you make a big release and you don't offer an improvement on the basics, people will be really angry. At the same time, people also expect that they get something that is inspiring. That needs to be something that is not perceived as, oh, finally Ableton has this feature, but, huh, this is interesting. But if you only do this, then the people will say, guys, you don't even have comping. Why do I, should I care about feature X? So you see that, is, uh, that this decision making there is a really complicated science. And um, no one can guarantee that we make the right decisions there. We just try our best to come up with something that at the end of the day uh, makes a lot of users happy. I tend to make long answers to short questions. <laughs> Were there any other questions from our participants? Oh, there's somebody up the back. Um, Doesn't matter. <laughs> question is question. Um, was, there, was there a question from you? No. Yeah, Ah, OK. Hey. And then uh, this gentleman, and then here, I think, and then. Kind of, hopefully a quick one, David, part of the studio team. Um, I saw, I think, follow your Facebook page the other day. I seem to remember you were having a bit of a discussion about design, especially regarding sort of modern plugins and stuff. And in the studios, we're sort of running a lot of the UAD sort of emulations of classic, classic machines, which I think you might have had maybe not issue with, but you had some things to discuss, which I thought if your viewpoint is still the same, might be quite interesting to share with a couple of people. Uh, I think I, I assumed you refer to the discussion I had about the UI of the Synclavier plugin. I can't remember the specific example, but in general. So, because normally I don't care. And as a matter of fact, um, I think UAD does a fantastic job uh, with, like DSP-wise, their stuff is insane. Um, and f if you had asked me a few years ago, I would be a strong opponent against this um, photorealistic kind of having hardware and software approach. Nowadays, um, I'm old and mild, and I say it sounds great and it looks familiar, and I wouldn't know how else to do it, so I'm fine with that. Uh, the specific case where I was annoyed was if a design tries to provoke the feeling of the real old stuff, and I just happen to love and know the real old stuff inside out. Um, and then within the design, there is this, this odd uh, inconsistencies that throw me out of my dream. Uh, it, it's kind of, you know you're in a movie and you are, 
you go in the movie and you want to experience this movie and you're, you're willing to, to accept that this is a science fiction and you are in the year 2200 and you're willing to accept that everyone can just teleport, it's all cool, and then there comes a commercial in between and brings you back to actually you're sitting in a cinema watching a movie. Um, and <clears throat> in, a, in a way, this specific plug-in to me felt like this. Everything on the surface felt like, yeah, I'm back in the 1980s and I'm operating this vintage machine and I forget that I'm using a plug-in because it sounds really great, it does, um, and I'm within this machine. And then I go to another page and the design has nothing to do anymore with this old machine. And on top of it, in my personal opinion, um, and I'm very opinionated about those topics, um, I'm a pain in the ass inside the company, uh, <clears throat> they did a lousy job. And this was what frustrated me and this was what cost my rent because I thought, uh, in this specific case, you only, there's probably only one chance for a manufacturer to bring this old classic back to life because uh, it's a lot of work to code this, so it was quite some effort. And if you have this unique chance to put a historical piece of, of music technology history into the 21st century and make it accessible to a new generation, um, you do this once. And if this one company has been doing it, it is very, very unlikely that another company will take the same effort to do it again. So for the rest of the time, all these upcoming generations which will never have the beauty of wasting one kilowatt of electricity for booting a crazy old tower of electronics, um, experience this machine via something that, in my opinion, is not nearly as cool as it could be. And that made me angry. Um, so this is the type of anal focus on detail that sometimes keeps me from making music. Um, so, but this was the specific moment. There's other uh, moments where, as I said, I, I use plugins that look like that, and I even discovered myself smiling at the fact that they look like, like the hardware. Uh, a, a plugin which also looks ridiculously close to the original hardware is, I forgot even, I think SoftTube released the device EQ1, which is a fantastic master, uh, DS1, the compressor. So. Um, this is a, a very expensive mastering compressor which I used when I was still cutting vinyl records in my past life. And I really like this compressor. And it's totally out of reach financially for normal people. And suddenly there's a plug-in which looks exactly like the hardware. And in comparison, it's still out of reach for a lot of people, but it's in comparison only 10% of the former out of reach. Um, and there I, I laughed about the fact that it looks so much like the old thing. So there, the familiarity effect of, haha, there's an LCD screen on a, dis on a display on a computer screen, which is itself an LCD screen, kind of <laughs> was cute. <laughs> I think so your then you, you, no, it was your, your question. Hello. Um, very nice and spacey, deep and minimal sound you have. Um, wanted to ask you how are you able to like uh, make it as an artist uh, making a sound that is niche uh, because I feel like uh, the whole world is, is, is changing because um, it's because of the type of sound um, that people are producing now the mainstream you know so how are you like able to make it on the on the underground uh, space and how does your day in studio like look like in terms of making like minimal and uh, spacey sounds? Okay, this is a, a few questions, so I try to, to answer them one by another. Um, the, the question of how I'm, I'm, I'm capable of, of doing this, in, in one way, being there early and having insanely great luck. So uh, the, the, the fact that I was able to make records and the fact that I met people who released my music was just a nice coincidence and it was certainly much easier uh, in the early 90s because the scene was so small. So that's the, the good luck of having been in Berlin at the right time and it wouldn't have happened if I were somewhere else. Um, 
unfortunately, a lot of things in life that are really important are just random, both in good ways or in really bad ways. And there is nothing you can do or not much you can do to avoid the one thing and to achieve the other. Um, you can just try to do your best always and see where you end. Um, the, the other question is easy to answer. My, my, my studio life is very limited these days because um, due to my, since I can think, my problem is that I'm interested in too many things. And so I made this big fuss about reducing options and at the same time, I feel like I try to become the Da Vinci of my own brand, which knows everything about everything, which is an, a concept that already in the Middle Ages didn't work anymore. Um, so I don't stop working for Ableton because I feel this company is part of my personal history, but also because I really like it. So parts of my brain just enjoys thinking about these technical aspects. Uh, I make still music because when I'm in the studio and I listen to sounds and I'm able to mix them and especially actually when I perform live, I have these moments where I feel severe happiness, where I think, wow, this now is really coming together nicely and this could go on forever. And sometimes I have this also when I go somewhere and listen to music. So I need to continue doing this simply because it's so satisfying. Um, it's also satisfying to, to work with my lasers because I can, I, I'm interested in this, so I also need to do it. Uh, if someone would tell me, okay, you have to decide between, you only do Ableton, you only do music, and you only do your installations, I would have a hard time to, to say what I would do. I, I, my, my first guess is that I could easiest go away without Ableton, um, but I'm not sure if on a second guessing this would still be true. Uh, but to make a decision between I only make music or I only work in my installations, that's impossible. I have no idea what I would prefer. Uh, so as a result, the, I try to, to find a very strict time management regime where I say, okay, I need to work on a new music. And now this week I try to not do office work, I try not to do emails, I just go in the studio. But unfortunately it rarely works like this. So I need to force myself to, to spend time in the studio. Uh, on a very practical level, what I did is I was reducing the amount of equipment I have so that I don't spend too much time thinking about do I use this synthesizer or this or this or do I use that plug-in or that um, and say, okay, if I want something that makes a nice string sound, I use this one machine which I have been using since the uh, mid-90s to do that and that's it. And I don't need to buy another synthesizer for the same job. Um, because instead of thinking about this sound is nice but perhaps this one is better or that one oh, is not connected. Ah, damn, it's not connected. This is uh, channel 17. Um, this is, uh, the cable is too short. You know, you, you, you spend easy an afternoon to get this one synthesizer to work and then you figure out at the end that this chord doesn't need to be in the track at all um, <laughs> instead of making music. So uh, I, I, I try to, to have a very strict regime there where I try to focus on things. One work recipe I figured out in the last years which helped me is that <clears throat> sometimes I'm not really in the mood to make music, but I'm in the mood to create sounds. So I just record sounds. I, I play with my machine and say, oh, this is an interesting bass sound or this is a cool percussion sound. I record this, I give it a nice name and I put it in my uh, sound library. And then when I'm in the mood of making music, I don't need to spend so much time making sounds. I just think, ah, oh, I had this great snare with this long reverb tail, and I just find it and I put it in, and if I have good luck, it's right there, and then I move on. So uh, part of my strategy to achieve the sound I achieve is 
by spending a lot of time making sounds and then just using them. And I guess this is pretty much everything I can contribute. Apart from that, there's always too much reverb on everything. <laughs> oh, does anybody else? Oh, we've got Mike over there. Hey, Robert, how you doing, man? Uh, since uh, I'm uh, on the production team here with the Red Bull, this, the purpose of this is to make these guys better producers. And I done asked a couple of the students to ask you this, but they scared. So I'm going to ask you, can you, uh, by you cutting records and me owning Ryan's old life, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these digital productions that's really smashed out in correct levels. I don't even call it a square wave at the top. I don't know what it is. It's a razorback. Mm -hmm. can, you ex can you help them out? and explain at what level should they be recording at to get the best out of Ableton so it sounds like what you was just playing. Well, I cannot recommend anyone to make something that sounds like my stuff because I'm personally not entirely satisfied with that sound. So please, if you try to um, record something, make something that sounds significantly better. Um, Good. That's not fishing for compliments. I, I find it really painful to listen to my own stuff because I only listen to the mistakes. Um, that's a personal flaw which is within me since I exist and this won't go away, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, the, the, the answer to the question is really difficult. Well, I want you to kick it with them while the dith dithering switch is on there for. Sorry, what? Dithering, dither, dither. D-I-T-H-E-R. Ah, well, dithering is, in my opinion, okay, we need to dive deep in here. So, um, the, in, in general, first of all, uh, <clears throat> if you, there's so many questions, I, I don't even know where to start, but I try to find the, uh, the, the, most, the most essential points. Uh, so, basically, as long as you work within something like, like life, um, the, the idea of maximum level, like when the meters turn red, as long as you're inside life, uh, is just a convention. And this convention says this is 0 dB. Uh, technically, all this inside is floating point mathematics, which means you could have a signal that is plus 30 dB, like would be on the meter, uh, half a meter above your screen, and it's still a perfectly uh, fine signal. The, the main point is, as soon as you are leaving your software and you go to your sound card, uh, you have a hard limit. And this hard limit is exactly the point where the meter turns in life full red. And if the meter turns full red, that means that your, your waveform just hits the maximum, and once it did hit this maximum, it stays at this maximum. So if you imagine a, a nice low sine wave bass, boom, yeah, and it's just a sine wave decaying, and it hits the maximum, so it becomes immediately flat, like if you really cut off the, the, the top of it. And the the mean part of that is what this does sonically is it creates an infinitely small spike in the sound. And this infinitely small spike repeats every time there is this, this hard edge. So it's at the beginning when it clips and it's at the end and then it's on the other side and it's again. And <clears throat> these hard edges create additional sounds um, which have no harmonic relationship to the original sound. And this is just really, really unpleasant distortion. And <clears throat> actually there is some harmonic relationship, I take the first thing back, but it's still distortion. And um, so unlike you really aim for this kind of harshness in your sound, uh, you should avoid that. That's a very simple rule. So whenever the meters in life turn red, um, it's probably a good idea to go lower. 
So the, the next interesting question is, how low can you go? So if we agree on that having everything at full level is a bad idea, then you can say, okay, having everything at uh, all the faders are completely down is also a bad idea because I don't hear anything anymore. So somewhere in between seems to be the truth. And the, the thing with digital is, digital is still a relatively young technology. And 20 years ago, uh, digital technology was still um, not nearly as good sounding as it is today. And the rule was always, you try to get as loud as possible without uh, introducing distortion. So you try to basically write your signal just above what is maximum because then you had the best headroom and you had the little, the least uh, noise and all these kind of things. So this was true until maybe 10 years ago. Nowadays, uh, technology and especially converter technology is so good that you can even e easily have a signal which has much less level um, and you still have only very little noise floor. And now this old idea of every signal has to be maximized to get the best uh, signal to noise ratio is not so true anymore. So you can be a little bit more um, adventurous towards uh, leaving more room. The, the, but if we come from a theoretical discourse to, to practical thing, the one thing that is um, interesting for making music, when, let's assume you have a sound which has a, a bass drum, a snare, a hi-hat, and a bass line going on and <clears throat> uh, these sounds are a bit dynamic, so sometimes some of them are louder and sometimes they are less loud. And you record them in such a way that none of these sounds uh, exceeds the limit. So everything is below the limit, so if you look at the waveform, there's a lot of air in between. Uh, then this sound might not sound as powerful as a sound which is put through a compressor where everything is really squashed and which for a lot of rhythmical music sounds more powerful, um, but it's the better material to go to the mastering studio because this is the old trick with the mastering studio. Um, the, the effect of a compressor is something you need to have experience and you need to listen to with really good speakers in different volumes to really be able to use it in such a way that the product sounds great on a really large system as well as on a small system. And if you don't have much experience with doing these things, it's much better just not to do it at all and go to a good mastering place. Or nowadays, potentially um, a clever artificial intelligence online mastering service. I never tried Lender, but um, a lot of research went into this. So I wouldn't decline the option that this might be better than um, a person these days. I don't know, but it's worth trying probably. Um, and then at the end, having someone who has a lot of experience, either a person or an algorithm, to do it in a way that has been proven to sound good on, on many systems. Uh, so the last thing is the, the DISA. Uh, so sometimes, the, the more insecure people are, the more they focus on technical details. We have lots of discussions about sound quality in Ableton Live, and um, <clears throat> everyone in the audio community knows everyone else. So every developer who is working on audio software probably met every other developer on Earth who is doing the same things. And um, this whole myth about different audio engines sounding different, forget about it. Um, Adding two channels in a digital workstation is always an addition, like five plus seven. Five plus seven is 13 in Logic, in Cubase, in Nuendo, in every single application everyone writes. So it's the same. Um, and I know that afterwards when this will be published, there will be endless discussions about this, but it's still the same. <clears throat> uh, Dissering is a process where Okay, you have 16-bit resolution on a, on a uh, digital to analog converter. This means you have some 65,000 individual steps um, as resolution in amplitude. And if you have a, a very low signal, that equals 96 decibel. Uh, 
So you have a very low signal, maybe a sine wave, and you make the sine wave less loud and less loud and less loud. So if maybe the sine wave is at minus 60 dB, which is pretty much inaudible in most scenarios, but for the sake of this talk, let's assume we have a sine wave at this level. And we have a 16-bit converter, then we are 36 dBs away from a minimum. That means you have six bit of resolution. Um, so a min minus 60 dB sine wave on a 16-bit converter is the same as a full-scale sine wave on an 8-bit converter, um, which is a nice, grungy 80s sine wave sound and not a pure sine wave. So the trick to improve these very, very low sounds is um, you add some, a little amount of random noise to it. And this sounds like a bad idea in theory, but uh, in the correct theory, it's a great idea because you can mathematically show that by adding this little noise, you distribute the distortion equally and the overall amount of distortions get less. So you basically use noise to mask an unpleasant effect. It's not entirely correct mathematically, but it's the, the, the result in a way. So what you do is if you're uh, recording something on a 16-bit file, you apply dithering at the end. There's a, a checkbox, for instance, in live, which different options. Doesn't matter in my opinion, because we're discussing something that no one will ever hear. But if you <coughs> want to be on the safe side, go for triangular. I can spend a few hours on a board, explain you why. Um, and this will give you a tiny little bit more of um, fidelity if you record something that is extremely quiet, like 100 times quieter than this. Um, and that's it. So in theory, if you record an orchestra with enormous dynamic and you have 100 microphones and you need to render individual stems of all of them, applying dithering to each one is a good idea. Practically, you can make an experiment. You can take a, a bitrate reduction plugin. You take your, famous, your, your most favorite pop song and you, t you put the plugin at 12-bit. Uh, 12-bit is obviously shit. Listen to it. And then um, make some, then close your eyes and randomly turn on and off the plugin a few times. And then close your eyes and listen to it and try if you can listen if the plugin is on or off. I guarantee you that under a normal listening situation, like here, with normal listening levels, you won't hear the difference. Because that's already 12-bit uh, is 6, 12, uh, 36. It's already in the range of minus 60, minus 70 dB. Um, so even with 12-bit, you are already on the safe side for uh, a nice signal to be um, above the quantization error. Uh, which means with 16-bit with or with 24-bit, you're way beyond that. Um, people should not think that much about these problems. People should think about, is the sound of the bass drum right? Is the decay good? Does the snare and the bass drum sound good together? Uh, that's where you need to spend your creativity and not um, in the levels, as long as it's not clipping. It's again a long answer to a short question. Um, I hope there's not a long question coming which leads to a potentially longer answer. Uh, <laughs> was this helpful a little bit? Good. <laughs> well, there's, there's one single thing. Um, I mean, it's one of the producers I admire most is uh, Mark Ernestus, or former Basic Channel, and now Rhythm and Sound, and all these amazing things. Um, and I always thought, because this stuff of them, especially the early stuff, is really deep. And you always think, they must use tons of compressors. And I had the, the chance to work in his studio once and I was surprised because I didn't find a single compressor in there. And I said, hey Mark, where are your compressors? And Mark told me, I really don't know how to work with compressors. Nothing here is compressed. So he's, he's super about mixing, about spending a, half a day to decide that this needs to be half a dB louder. And he's doing a perfect mix and no compression. And to me, this was really uh, a surprise. So, uh, because I felt I'm not the only person on the planet who 
has trouble with compression. Uh, I always, you know, everyone tells you, yeah, you need to compress that, and I try it, and it sounds squashed, and then I turn the compressor off, and I'm happier again. The, the only thing where I figured out after years of, uh, of being the first member of the anti-compression league um, was that <coughs> uh, when I perform club stuff uh, live, then having a compressor is sometimes helpful because on a smaller PA you just get more the feeling of intensity. Um, so my pro tip for performing live is add a compressor at the, at the end of your output signal and have a slider uh, mapped to compression ratio, no, to, to threshold. So the, the monolake secret sauce tip is set the ratio to uh, one to two, very fast attack, medium fast decay, and put a fader on the threshold and map it inversely so that when the fader is all down, the threshold is at zero dB, and when the fader is all up, it's at minus 25 dB. With this uh, strategy, and have um, make-up gain turned on. So in this, set, in this scenario, if the fader is all down, your compressor is transparent, and the further you move the fader up, the more compression in your signal you get. And that's a great thing to play with when you perform club music live. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Any more short or long questions? from the room. No? Good. <laughs> I think we, almost. We, we squashed them. <laughs> oh, there we go. Just one. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Henke. Um, <laughs> thanks for making my life uh, much easier. Uh, good, good to know. <laughs> I'm specifically talking about repitch warping, <laughs> but yeah. I have a here uh, perhaps an innocent question. Um, I'm just curious, uh, where does the word Ableton come from? Good one. Oh, that's, that's, the, that's the only one. Okay, uh, this is I have more, but yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, so when you found a company, you need a name. You know, like, um, if sometimes you have good luck, you have a name that just works, like Siemens Krupp or something like this. Or Monolake. Well, that's a lake, not a name. Um, so, uh, you found a company and you don't want to call it the Bayless company because it's kind of childish. Um, and there's more people than Gerhard Bayless involved, so anyway. The first thing you do is you think, ha, huh, it needs to be a name that describes the product, right? It has to be a name that is something related to sound. So, I mean, we're talking about early internet, but internet search was already existing, so you think, oh yeah, let's call it, I make this up, um, electronic wave, electronicwave.com. You Google it, gone. You try any other combination of anything that is sound, wave, um, pulse, uh, you know, all these kinds of names that in some way um, seem to be related to what you're doing. And every possible combination of names um, is already given. Then you think, okay, let's be a bit more floral. You know, you try to come up with some name that is sounding nice, like Onyx, uh, Rose. Um, again, I make these things up, but this was the, the thinking process. So you type in all those names in a search engine. Um, you know, waverose.com. I, I, I bet it's existing. Uh, so you gave up on all these names, and then you end up with thinking, okay, let's just throw letters together. So that's what we did. Um, we just th wrote random names on a, I remember this sitting in the conference room. I really, I, this is funny, it comes back to my memory. We were sitting here, maybe five people, on a table with pens and paper, and we just randomly scrabbled some names. And one of those was Ableton. And there was then even a question if it has an E or not. And, the, and it was really just, I don't even know who came up with this, with this name. We had tons of names on the list and we put them all on the, on the wall and we looked at them. And <clears throat> so the funny thing about Ableton was that uh, I said I like this because it, it sounds slightly like a British high-end manufacturer. Oh, wow, this is an Ableton L15, nice. Um, so I like this, um, 
And uh, then there was a question if there should be an E, like tone, you know, able to produce a tone, able tone. Um, and then someone said, ah, the E, the back, nah, able tone. Nah. I mean, able ton is good, yeah. Um, Ton is German for Ton, it's a German company, so Ton, Ableton, Able Ability, that's kind of nice here. Ableton, hmm, Ableton. Now let's think about it. Hmm. What do you think about Ableton? Ableton, 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 Ableton. <laughs> Sounds like shit in German. Ableton, Ableton, I, I like it. Yeah, it grows on me, Ableton, Ableton. Let's write it down. How does it look? It's written down. Or make it all capitals. Eh, nah. I guess this is when every company tries to come up with a name. Long story short, Ableton. So. <laughs> and of course, www.ableton.com. Website not available. Yeah! Like <laughs> it's free, it's free. Register. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm way over my schedule with all the other stuff. Which mm -hmm. needs to be okay, okay. Done. Well, let's let Robert get back to his studio. Thank you no, once no, again. I have more stuff. Oh, here. Oh, yes, radio. <laughs> yes, yes, radio. Thank you again for being here.